Praise God. Do you love your pastor? Praise God. Would you give God some praise for sending Dallas and Holly your way? They're, 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 do you love their kids? Praise God. Don't you love their kids? I tell you, it says something powerful about a pastor and his wife when their children are following in the ways of the Lord. Praise God. I want to join your pastor in encouraging everyone that possibly can to park up at the high school. Now, how many of you in the room have someone in your life, maybe a family member, but there's someone in your life you're not sure they would go to heaven if something happened to them right now, and you want them to go to heaven. You Raise your hand. Everybody with your hand up, park at the high school Sunday. Say, Pastor, why are you saying that? Because everything we do in the kingdom of God, we do by faith. And faith without works is dead. And so one of the greatest works we could do in faith is say, God, I'm going to park at the high school believing that you're going to save my loved one by this act of faith. And uh, I, I, I've been right where your pastor is uh, for several years, our church. We were growing, and we did not have parking spaces. I thank God for every neighbor that let us tear their yards up. I thank God we, the, the, uh, the water board in our community was right next door. We thank God for them allowing us to park. But uh, it, it is a wonderful testimony in the community to see you guys fill up, not just your parking, but to find out that you're filling up every parking space in the neighborhood, in the community. I'm telling you, it does something powerful. So God's on the move right here. Look at somebody and say, get on the move with him. Praise God. Amen. I had a wonderful time last night. I enjoyed this church. There's such a beautiful spirit here. I go for somebody to smile real big and say, it's all right. You don't have to be churchy here tonight. You don't have to be religious here tonight. You can enjoy yourself in the presence of God and in the presence of other people. Amen. Now, uh, my, my brand new book will be out this next week. I was hoping I would get some and be able to bring them with me, but I want to encourage you. Uh, you'll need to get this book that's out. I've written this book with my grandchildren in mind. Uh, my uh, grandbabies moved off to Kansas and, and Florida, and I don't get to have the influence with them that I'd love to have. But um, I am a spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Holy Ghost, fire-filled believer. And uh, I believe that what we need in our churches and all across our country right now, especially in the culture and in the day that we're living in, we need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I don't get to influence my grandchildren and share with them the relationship that I have with the Holy Spirit, but I want them to have it. So with that in mind, I wrote this book about the Holy Spirit entitled Drenched, Thoroughly Covered and Completely Filled. It's about having a hand-holding, neck-hugging relationship every day with the Holy Spirit. Not just good church services. But the Holy Spirit is a person that lives on the inside of every born-again believer. And He wants to be active in your life every day. And so I want to encourage you to get that. They got that on the screen. You can just scan that, uh, scan that QR code and it will bring up and you can, you can order that. Also, you can get a study guide to go with it. For any of you that are looking for things to do small group ministry with or have Bible study with, you can get that. And uh, now this part of it is free. If you enjoy the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, how many of you enjoy the YouVersion Bible app on your phone? Free. Go to the plans and search drenched, and you will find a seven-day devotional for, taken directly from that book right there for you, and that's all free. And I'll tell you, if you get on that devotional, you'll be saying, we got to find that book. we got to get that book. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want, I, I'm doing that tonight because my wife, she got on to me last night for not telling you all about the book. But so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be able to make it back to the... Amen. I just, you know, wanted to be able to get back to the room tonight and not get locked out. Uh, 
If you have your Bibles tonight, look with me to Acts chapter 19. And while you're finding that, I want to say thank you to these pastors, these ministers that are with us tonight. Especially this one that's coming to the prayer services that you're having here. Um, this this is, is a rare situation in our in our culture and in our climate, whenever you have pastors working together, hand in hand with one another, building relationships with each other, serving in the same area and the same community. We, let's just put our hands together and thank God for bringing our pastors together in our community. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 19, I want to read verse 11 and verse 12, and I'll be reading from uh, the New Living Translation. Um, normally when I go out and preach in places that's, you know, away from the church I pastor, I strictly stick to the King James Version. Boy, I have a, I have a way of doing that. Uh, I, I stick to the King James Version because I, I really don't want anybody to backslide during one of my services because I read from a different version. But I realized last night when I walked in this house that uh, this was a church that was not easily offended. Isn't that a beautiful spirit? This is a church that's not critical and judgmental of those who are coming through the doors as well as those that are sitting around with us. And, oh, I'm telling you, you, you don't realize how refreshing it is. You ought to get in the car and go with me sometime to some of the churches I get to go to. And I shared with you last night that uh, back in 21, I had a severe case of COVID and was in the uh, hospital intensive care unit for 35 days and uh, uh, had several out-of-body experiences. And the doctors were calling my wife, telling her that she needed to give them permission to put me on the vent because I was in total opposition to the ventilator. I said, if I'm leaving, I'm not leaving on a vent. And I wouldn't allow them to put me on the vent, so I was really in a fight and a struggle. And they called her and said, uh, we, we need to get him on the vent. We don't think he'll make it through the night. And um, she said, well, what's his chances if you put him on the vent? They said, anywhere from 5 to 7% chance of making it if we put him on the vent. And my sweet wife said, let's give him seven more days. Now, I had told her before the ambulance left with me that the insurance was paid up. And so, so tonight I want to share with you from the Word of God some of the things that I discovered and the Holy Spirit brought to my remembrance. Some while laying in a hospital bed and other times while I was recovering. I've been in a process of recovery now for almost two full years. And I'm still not 100% back. But I'm going to share with you the medicine that I've been taking from the Word of God. And I'm getting healthier and stronger. I weighed 196 pounds before COVID and while I was in the hospital, I dropped down to close to 140 pounds. And tonight, I'm standing before you a strong, healthy 173 pounds. <laughs> and, <laughs> as a church, we believe in divine healing. And I decree and declare every morning and all day long and throughout the night as I wake up that I am living in divine health that has been purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't have to wait on a doctor's report to say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Now, um, we're going to talk about healing tonight, but I want to read an incredible portion of Scripture in the New Testament, Acts 19, verse 11 and verse 12. God gave Paul, everybody say Paul, the power to perform, listen to this, unusual miracles. Unusual miracles. Look over at somebody right now and say, 
there's an unusual anointing in this room. The Holy Spirit has moved through the praise and worship tonight in a different way than he moved here last night. He has set this room for us tonight to receive unusual miracles. Who will believe with me for your unusual miracle? So that when handkerchiefs and aprons that were merely touched Paul's skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Sometimes your sickness can be a disease. Sometimes your sickness can be a spirit of affliction that needs to be cast out, that needs to be expelled. How many of you in the room right now are on medication? Would you raise your hand? If you're on medication, look at all this. I'm in the right service. I've got the right message. I want to believe with everyone that's got your hand up that the next time you go back to the doctor, your doctor is going to reduce your medication, and he's going to take you off of medication. Now, I want you to activate your faith because it's all done by faith in Jesus Christ. So by faith, I want you to turn and look at someone, and I want you to open your mouth, and I want you to say to them, the doctor is going to take me off of my medication. Now, I want to support that by saying to you, on behalf of the mother of Jesus, Mary, when the angel came and spoke to her, she opened her mouth and said, I am the servant of God, and may everything God has said about me come to pass. Now, everything God said about her followed the words of her mouth when she said, I am. So I want you to open your mouth now and look at somebody and scream at them with all the gusto you've got and say, I am coming off of my medication. Now, l please listen to me. I'm not asking you to diagnose yourself. I'm not asking you to play the role of your own doctor. I'm asking you to get your doctor involved with you so he can be the one that will verify the unusual miracle that God has performed in your life. The reason I'm saying this to you is because my doctor, after I got out, home. I went to my family doctor. He teaches, uh, you, you can be seated, he teaches uh, Sunday school at the First Baptist Church. And uh, I was going in and out of his office and he was watching the power of God work in my body. My lungs were covered in scar tissue. They told me that scar tissue does not disappear on its own. That scar tissue uh, has to be surgically removed. And even after a surgery, because of the surgery, more scar tissue will return. And it will be a lifelong process of removing and coming back. Both lungs were covered in scar tissue from COVID. The doctor, my family doctor, x-rayed me. He saw that. He said, these are the worst-looking set of lungs that I have seen on any COVID patient that lived. Four weeks later, I went back to Birmingham to the lung specialist that treated me in the hospital. They tested me. They uh, worked me out with exercises. And uh, then they told me to come back in four weeks. I came back in four weeks. They x-rayed me. They tested me. They told me to come back in four weeks. In four weeks, I went back. They x-rayed me. This time, they, they, they tested me over and over, over. They wore me out. And then she brought us 
us in and set us down. And she said, now, when you came back uh, the first time, we x-rayed your lungs. And uh, when you left the hospital, your lungs were full of scar tissue. But when you came back for your four-week checkup, there was only one little small scar in the bottom of your right lung. She didn't tell me or my wife about that on that visit. She thought perhaps it was misread on the, on the uh, uh, x-ray. So four weeks later, she x-rayed me again, and she said, not only was there only one little small scar in the bottom of your right lung, but that scar was smaller in the second x-ray. On the third time, they x-rayed me. She said, and now then, the scar is even smaller. You don't have to ever come back to see me again. So I went to my, my family doctor. I didn't tell him I had been back to Birmingham. I didn't tell him about anything the lung specialist said. When I went in for my checkup, he wanted to do another chest x-ray. I smiled and said, sure, gladly. And he gave me the x-ray. He came back in my room and he had the first x-ray where my lungs were full of scar tissue. And then he had the x-ray and he said, there's only one little small scar right in the bottom of your right lung. Both doctors, not knowing one another, not communi communicating with one another, confirmed the miracle that had taken place in in my lungs. I'm standing here in front of you tonight, and I'm not supposed to be able to have enough breath to ever preach again. On my first visit to my family doctor, I went in and seen him. I was on oxygen. I was barely able to move around. And he looked at me, and I said to him, now, this was in February, and I said, uh, I, Doctor, I'm going to preach Easter Sunday if I can't go but five minutes and have to sit in a chair. And he looked at me, and then I left. Two weeks later, I went back for another checkup. I had gained seven pounds. And, uh, and, he, and he said, let me tell you what I told these nurses when you left here. He said, that boy thinks he's going to preach Easter Sunday. And I stopped him before he could say anything else. I said, wait a minute, I've done changed my prayers. I've told God that I'm going to preach Easter Sunday. Not only am I going to preach Easter Sunday, we're going to have two Sunday morning services at my church, and I'm going to preach at least 15 minutes in each service. Guess who was sitting on the front row? That doctor was sitting on the front row in that service. What am I? I'm saying all this to say this to you. There's somebody out there that's watching you and they need you to receive an unusual miracle somebody out there is studying your life and they need you to put your faith on the line and believe that nothing is impossible with God and nothing is impossible under those who believe him now I feel the Holy Spirit in this room you could just raise your hand right now and receive your unusual miracle because it's all done by faith in your God Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to share many, many verses of Scripture, so you might want to get you a pen or a pencil, something handy, because the reason I'm sharing this with you is because one of these verses may jump out at you. If it does, that's God Himself speaking to you particularly, and you need to make note of that Scripture because God is trying to say something to you, and you need to mark that Scripture in your Bible. You need to write it on your hand. You need to carry that Scripture with you into your prayer time. You need to grab hold of it by faith and declare that the word of God is yours. It has been branded on your heart, in your mind, and you refuse to let go of it. Amen. You hold on. So look at somebody and say, you better write it down tonight. Now, how many of you have got one of these books? I tell you, you need to get you one of these books. This is an amazing book. The Bible teaches us that our faith in God comes by hearing His Word. Look at somebody and say, open your big ears. 
Oh, y'all not look. Li, li, the author of the word, do you see this in the New Testament? Jesus himself is the one who keeps repeating it. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Look at somebody and say, if you can hear it, you can have it. Oh, hallelujah. If you can hear that you're healed, you can be healed. If you can hear that God has a miracle for you, you can have a miracle. So I want to challenge you to pay close attention to the words of God tonight that I'm going to speak to you. And I want to ask everyone that needs healing or deliverance from anything or some kind of miracle, I'm going to challenge you right now. Look, look over at somebody and say, now loosen up. Don't get awkward on me. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. I'm the one that's from the south. You guys are all up here from the north. Y'all are supposed to be full of boldness and courage. So don't act timid now. Somebody say amen. Come on out. Let it shine. I want to ask you if you need healing tonight, if you need deliverance tonight, you need some kind of miracle, I want you to stand up on your feet right now. Now, this is going to be strictly an act of faith. We're going to show God that we are going to do more than say, I believe, but we're going to put some action because faith without works is dead. So I want to ask everybody that's standing to move out of your seat and come as close to the front as you can and get in one of these empty seats. And if there's anybody between you and an empty seat, I want you to get real grouchy with them by faith. And I want you to say, move over. My miracle is in that seat. Okay, move in Jesus' name. You want to come off that medicine? You want to come out of that habit? You want God to give you an unusual miracle? Amen. You've got to activate your faith. I can stand up here and preach to you all night. I can talk to you. I can plead with you. I can pray for you. But sometime you've got to move. Sometime you've got to. There you go, Mike. This is good. This is, we got some faith right here. Sometime you've got to make your move. Are you hearing me? The little woman with the issue of blood could not stand over here in the dark and expect a healing. She had to move out from the shadows, dive into the midst of the crowd, and press her way through. I feel the Holy Spirit right now. I might not even get to go much farther before somebody starts receiving what you need from God. If you believe the Holy Spirit's moving in you right now, raise your hands and begin to thank God for your healing. Begin to thank God for your miracle. Begin to thank God for your deliverance. Begin to thank God for that supernatural power that you're experiencing in your life. Glory, 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 glory. Father, we curse every sickness. We curse every disease. In the name of Jesus, we come against spirits, oh God, that cause blood pressure to be high, that cause blood sugar to be high. In the name of Jesus, we pull down the disease. We cast out the spirits of affliction that are causing symptoms in people's bodies. In the name of Jesus, we declare health. We declare wholeness. In Jesus' name, we come against symptoms we command you to go go in Jesus name you cannot stay we're blood bought in the name of Jesus you're trespassing on blood bought property in Jesus name oh my oh my oh my oh look over at somebody and say God has brought you to this service to be healed if you're struggling with some kind of a habit you can't break or even an addiction that's trying to come back to you, look over at somebody and say, God brought me to this service to be set free. Come on. Break it, break it, break it with the words of your mouth. Open your mouth and say, I am free. Yes, I am. I am free. I am free. Yes, I am. I am free. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God.
Raise those hands up right now and receive. Holy Spirit, speak to us tonight. Mm. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Praise him, somebody. Praise him. Hallelujah. Woo. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit has spoken tonight. I said the Holy Spirit has spoken. He's confirming His Word right here with signs, wonders, and miracles. Right now, I want you to raise your hands and let go of the symptoms. Turn loose of the symptoms. Begin to declare, I'll never feel that pain again. I'll never have that feeling again. I am free. My knees are free. My elbows are free. My hips are free. My feet are free. My shoulders are free. My mind is free. My body is free. I have been set free free by the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am, I am, I am healed. I am a whole person. Yes, I am in Jesus' name. Wow. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do here. I'm not going to tell you to sit down. I'm not going to tell you you got to keep standing up. I want you to respond to the Holy Spirit while I try to share some more of the Scripture with you. But these words that I'm about to release belong to you. As long as we keep treating the Word of God like it belongs to somebody else, it will never be active in us. But when we begin to treat the Word of God like it belongs to us, then everything in this book will begin to manifest, manifest itself in our lives because we're His children. Have you noticed that you really don't have to introduce Holly and Dallas's children You walk into the room and you can pick out his children among all the others in the crowd because they favor their mom and their dad. And you listen to them talk and they sound like their mom and their dad. God wants you to get so much of this in you that you take on the reflection of the author and the finisher of your faith. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. He wants you to get so much of this in you that when you open your mouth, you sound like the author and the finisher of your faith. Instead of saying, I feel bad, you open your mouth and say, I have been anointed with the oil of gladness. <laughs> Hallelujah. So get ready to receive unusual miracles because these verses are what God has personally said to you. And once God's Word is allowed to come alive in your heart, it's going to change the rest of your life. Look over at somebody and say, I'll never be the same after this service. Everybody point your fan at Pastor Dallas and say, thank you for this service, Pastor. Thank you for calling me out on Saturday night, Pastor. Now listen to me, God's Word, when God's Word is allowed to come alive in your heart, it's going to change your entire person. It could happen instantly. It could happen in a process. 
over a period of time, it could develop in you. Look at somebody say, it's working in me right now. God could get finished with me before the service is over. But he's not going to stop working on me. I said he's not going to start working on me. So look over at somebody and say, God has started my healing right now. And everything God starts, he finishes. Come on, is that the word? Maybe you're struggling with alcoholism and your parents and all through your family it's been a struggle. It's been like a curse on your family and you still have the desire and the impulses. Amen. But tonight God has started your deliverance in you. It could be instantaneous tonight. You may not ever have another desire for it. The taste could be wiped right out of your mouth. The craving just cleansed right out of your bloodstream. Amen. Or you could walk out of this place. Amen. And all at once you lose uh, the desire for it. And, 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 and it's not nearly as strong as it was. And because God has started something in you. and Whatever you're struggling with. We want to receive from God, don't we? We've got to be willing to receive because our receiving is His testimony in us. Sometimes when God is working on a testimony, He performs an instantaneous miracle or healing or deliverance. At other times... He has people walk out their deliverance, getting stronger along the way. Did you see the ten lepers? They're all ten lepers, and they come to Jesus, and they want to be healed. And you know what Jesus says? Go show yourself. Stop keeping it a secret that you're struggling. Admit to yourself and to others you've got an issue, you've got a problem, but you are wanting help. Come on. And the Bible says, while they were on their way, they noticed that they had been healed. God was working a testimony. Nine of them noticed that they had been healed and took off back to their old life. How many times do we go to church and God touches us and we go right back to our old way of thinking, our own way of behaving, our own old way of talking, our old way of living? One turned around and came back to Jesus, fell at his feet, and said, thank you, with a loud voice. He glorified God, and the Bible said that Jesus looked at him and said, your faith has made you Oh, oh, watch this. This was not an instantaneous miracle from him. He's been on the same journey the other nine were on. The same thing that were happening to the other nine was happening to him. But he was so grateful for his miracle. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. You have got to have a grateful heart for everything God ever does for you. And you cannot be ashamed of it. You have got to lift up your voice. You've got to get loud about it, which means you've got to tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it. I am healed. I am delivered. I am set free. Jesus has paid the price for me. Now, watch this. Leprosy. Leprosy, like sin, takes things from us, like eating things away from us. It, it likes to take the little things. 
like little toes and little fingers and little pieces of the eyes and the ears and the lips and, and even even it'll, it'll even get in your mouth and begin to take little things uh, down uh, uh, even in your throat and your vocal cords. You'll lose your voice. All those things, that's just like sin, isn't it? But while this guy is sharing with Jesus what God has done for him along the way with a grateful heart and grateful spirit, all at once he's getting more than just a healing. He's being made whole. While he's saying thank you, he's getting back everything leprosy has taken away from him. While he's on his knees worshiping, that's why worship is so important, guys. I love this church because you're a worshiping church. Amen. It's hard to get God to do things for you if all you want to do is be a little statue and come sit and stare. But if you say, God, I humble myself, heart, soul, mind, spirit, and body, throw my whole self into bringing glory to your name. Amen. All at once, all of the things that sin has taken away from you, sin is taken away from your family, those little things start to come back again. While the man's worshiping, all at once he his eyes come back. His ears come back. His fingers come back. Everything that sin has done to him, God has reversed the curse and given back to him. I'm saying to somebody tonight, God is building a testimony in your life. You could get it instantly. It could happen over a period of time, but while you're walking it out, God is going to be restoring back to you everything sickness took away, everything the devil took away, everything the addiction took away. God is going to give back to you. All right, listen now. This, this is our attitude right here. I want to receive from God Everybody say that with me. I want to receive from God any way God wants to do it. See, that's sometimes that's the blockage. God's already paid the price. It's already bought and paid for. It's a done deal. But we want God to do it our way. Matter of fact, we'll get so hung up on having to have it our way that we'll refuse to believe that God could do it any other way. Matter of fact, if we're not careful, we'll get so religious with it that we'll even say that God don't do it that way. So we've got to be ready to receive. God, I'll take healing any way you want to bring it, any way you desire. But God, if you want to use a doctor, go ahead. I'm not against doctors. Jesus is not against doctors. Matter of fact, Jesus is a doctor. He loves all the doctors. What he wants the doctors to do is work with him. He's in the business of trying to help us get well. If, he want, if God wants to use treatments, if God wants to use medication, if God wants to use a diet, if God wants to use exercise, if God wants to use loving other people, if God wants to use forgiving other people. What we have to do is be patient. Because the word of God is like a seed. And I'm about to start strowing some seed. Okay? It takes time for a seed to germinate and produce. I want to drop enough seed on you on Saturday night that your pastor's going to call me six months from now, a year from now, and he's going to tell me about what has sprang up out of this Saturday evening service because of the seed that I'm about to strow throughout our hearts and our minds. It takes time for that seed to germinate, but once it does, it's going to start providing fruit. Now listen to me. God never works in selfishness. 
we can get very many amens on that. If God is working a healing in you, a miracle in you, a deliverance in you, as much as he loves you, he's not just doing it to make you feel better. He's not just doing it to take your pain and your suffering away. He's doing it because your life is connected to somebody that he loves as much as he loves you and he wants to perform some kind of unusual work in you that will draw someone else to him. Now, if we're not careful, we just think about ourselves. God, I feel so bad. I wish you would help me. God, I need this. I need that. I, 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 I. And God is saying, if you thought about your nephew, if you thought about that co-worker, if you thought about those people at the church that have not showed up in several weeks, who is it? I don't know who it is, but you need to understand that you need to humble yourself before God, throw all the faith you can into Him and believe Him for your miracle and then tell it loud and tell it everywhere because God did not give you that miracle just to make you feel good or to feel better. You have, a, oh, you don't hear me. You're, every miracle comes with responsibility. You're going to be held accountable for every good gift. You're going to be held accountable by God in heaven for every blessing. There is a risk. When God blesses you, he's not blessing you just so you can go around and say, hey, hey, boy, God put it on me. Have you seen my new car? We have turned this thing into a prosperity message. We made it about houses and cars and about finances. We made it about, and we need those things. I'm not against those things. Amen. But God is not blessing us so that we can flaunt his goodness in front of a sick world. God is taking us in the midst of our sickness, and he's using us so he can say to a sick world, I can do the same thing for you. Watch this. When Peter and John came out of that 10-day prayer meeting and they headed back to church, you get locked up in a prayer meeting, it'll make you want to go to church. <laughs> they head back over to the church, and on the way in, there was a beautiful gate and a lame beggar was sitting there. And Peter and John looked at him while he had his little begging cup out, hoping they'd drop a few coins in. And Peter and John looked at him, and Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. He was not trying to reveal to him his economic status. It wasn't about the silver or the gold. Peter was, listen, don't misunderstand. Peter was not saying I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. Peter was not saying I'm poor and I'm pitiful and I can't help you. Oh, no. Here's what Peter was saying. Peter was saying you've had some silver before and you've had some gold before. Other people have passed by and dropped some silver and some gold on you. Amen. But you're still lame and you still can't walk and you still can't move like other people can. I have got something. He said, such as I have. I have got something, and what I have is more powerful than silver and more powerful than gold. I could give you a little silver and a little gold, and it might feed you for a day or so. But if I give you what I have that's more valuable and more powerful than silver and gold, you'll never have to beg again. Amen. You, 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 can, you, can, walk, live, you can live like healthy people live if you'll receive what I have to give. Y'all, 
What is the Lord saying? The Lord is saying, I want to do the same thing for you that I did for Peter and John. I want to give you something that's more powerful than earthly treasure. I want to give you something that you can give to somebody else. And he reached out and took the lame man by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He leaping up stood and walked and went into the house of God rejoicing with the family of God. I've come to tell somebody you can have a healing if it's about going after somebody else. You can have a miracle if it's about going after somebody else. You can have anything you need from God if it's about going after somebody else. Attach your need to somebody else's salvation. Let me get to my scriptures. Are we okay? This book is all about healing and miracles and deliverance from cover to cover. You could even get it in the coordinates. You could get it in the maps. So get ready. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hurry right through these verses. In the Old Testament, here's what the Lord says to you. These are your, your scriptures. Look at somebody and say, I'm about to take my medicine now. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Exodus 15, 26. Now listen to me. While I'm reading these scriptures, if any of these scriptures hit your heart and come alive, you feel something moving you, jump up on your feet right there and throw your hand in the air and say, I got it. What are you doing? You're activating your faith. You've heard the word, and you're... That was good, wasn't it? I am the Lord that healeth thee, Exodus 15, 26. You shall be buried in a good old age, Genesis 15, 15. You shall come to your grave in full age like a shock of corn cometh in its season, Job 5, 26. Look at somebody say, I'm going to live a long time. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. Exodus 12, 13. I will take sickness away from the midst of you, and the number of your days I will fulfill. Exodus 23, 25. I will not put any of the diseases you are afraid of on you, but I will take all sickness away from you. Deuteronomy 7, 15. It, it will be well with you, and your days shall be multiplied and prolonged as the days of heaven upon the earth. Deuteronomy 11 and 9. I turned the curse into a blessing unto you because I loved you. Deuteronomy 23, 5. I have redeemed you from the curse of every sickness and every plague. Deuteronomy 28, 61. Galatians 3, 13. As your days, so shall your strength be. Deuteronomy 33 and 25. Somebody raise up both hands and say, I am strong. I have found a ransom for you. Your flesh shall be fresher than a child's, and you shall return to the days of your youth. Job 33, 25. If you're over 39, you ought to have been on your feet right now saying glory to God. Amen. I'm getting my teenage years back. Y'all don't hear me. I still got a whole lot of a 16-year-old left in me. Oh, my God. Amen. Can you believe, amen, that COVID almost killed me, but tonight I'm standing up here with good breath in my lungs, and I'm declaring the healing word of God. I'm declaring the miracle working power of God. I've come to tell somebody, if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. And because he's done it for me, I've come to tell you, it's on the way to your life. Hey, listen, 
I have healed you and brought you up from and brought up your soul from the grave. I have kept you alive from going down into the pit. Psalm 30 and verse 1. I will give you strength and bless you with peace. Psalm 29 11. I will preserve you and keep you alive. Psalm 41 and 2. I will strengthen you upon the bed of your languishing. I will turn all your bed into uh, away from sickness. Psalm 43 or Psalm 41 and 3. I am the health of your countenance and 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 your God, Psalm 43, 5. No plague shall come near your dwelling, Psalm 91, 10. I will satisfy you with long life, Psalm 91, 16. I heal all your diseases, Psalm 103, 3. I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from your destruction, Psalm 107, 20. You shall not die, but live and declare my works, Psalm 118, verse 17. I don't know if I'll get through all this with us or not. I went into the hospital. The doctor came into that intensive care unit after I'd been in there about 15 minutes. And he said, we need to go ahead and get you on the vent. And I said, no, we're not doing that. We're going to do everything we can to stay off the vent. He got upset, refused to come back and see me. I was okay with that. They sent another doctor to me. That doctor came in. He said... How are you doing? And I said, I'm doing fantastic. He said, well, according to your charts, you're not. Up out of my mouth came these words. I've never lived by a doctor's chart. I've always lived by the word of God. And the word says, I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the wonderful works of God. That doctor looked at me, amen, like I was sicker than I knew. Those nurses would come in and stare down at me as my body was wasting away. I had, didn't even have the strength to roll my own self over in the bed. They'd look at me like they was afraid to touch me or move me because I could just die at any moment. And I would whisper out of my mouth, Don't be afraid. I'm not going to die on you. God is healing me. While I was laying right there in that hospital bed, I'm trying to tell you, you can't wait for the, um, the, the, the health to return. Turn before you open your mouth and declare the word of God over yourself. You've got to open your mouth while you're still sick. You've got to open your mouth while you're still suffering. You've got to open your mouth while you're still addicted. You've got to open your mouth while you're still in trouble. You've got to open your mouth because the power of life and death is in your mouth. And you activate the miracle with your mouth. You activate the healing with your mouth. Somebody shout, I am healed. I am Delivered. I am blessed in Jesus. I heal your broken heart and bind up your wounds. Psalm 147 3. The years of your life shall be many. Proverbs 4 10. Trusting me brings health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Proverbs 3 8. My words are life to you and health like medicine to all of your flesh. Proverbs 4 22. My good report makes your bones fat. Proverbs 15 and 30. My pleasant words are sweet to your soul and health to your bones. Proverbs 16, 24. My joy is your strength and a merry heart does good like a medicine. Nehemiah 8, 10 and Proverbs 17, 22. The eyes of the blind shall be open. The eyes of them that see shall not be dim. Isaiah 32 and 3. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The ears of them that hear shall hearken. Isaiah 33, 32 and 3. The tongue of the dumb shall sing. The tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. Isaiah 35, 6. The lame shall leap as a heart. Isaiah 35, 6. I will recover you and make you live. I am ready to save you. Isaiah 38, 16. I give power to the faint. I increase strength to them that have no might. Isaiah 40, 29. I will renew your strength. I will strengthen you and I will help you. 
you. Isaiah 40, 31. To your old age and gray hairs, I will carry you and I will deliver you. Isaiah 46, 4. I bore your sickness. Isaiah 53, 4. I carried your pains. Isaiah 53, 4. I will put to sickness. I was put to sickness for you. Isaiah 53, 10. With my stripes, you are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. I will heal you. Isaiah 57, 19. Your light shall break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth speedily. Isaiah 58, 8. I will restore health unto you, and I will heal you of all your wounds, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 30, 17. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure you and reveal unto you the abundance of peace and truth. Jeremiah 33, 6. I will bind up that which was broken, and I will strengthen that which was six. It's Ezekiel 34, 16. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. Ezekiel 37, 5. Whithersoever the river shall come, they shall live, and they shall be healed, and everything shall live wherever the river comes. Isaiah 47, 9. Seek me, and you shall live. Amos 5 and 4. I have arisen with healing in my wings. Malachi 4 and 2. I wish somebody would praise God for what he has promised you as a blood bowl child of God. Now, I want to turn the tables on the devil tonight. All over the religious community of the United States of America, there has been a spirit of resistance. Pastors are struggling, working diligently, pleading with their people, casting vision for their people, trying to get their people to work together like a team to rescue their families, their homes, their neighborhoods, and their communities. And we won't even hardly lift our hands without getting offended at the worship leader. She makes us stand up too much. She's too loud. I'll shout whenever I want to. Ain't nobody going to tell me. And you're sick. And your kids are lost. And you're struggling financially. Your husband's still alcoholic. You've got as many devils as you ever had while you were out there living for the devil. But that spirit of resistance is on you. We're in rebellion to uh, anybody telling us what to do. Look over at somebody and say, I don't like nobody telling me what to do. You need to drag your good self back down to the altar. And you need to lay that up on that altar. And you need to say, God, I'm going to crucify this thing right now. I'm going to learn how to be obedient. Not just to you, but to your servants. When they give me an instruction, I'm going to obey that instruction. And I'm going to trust you, God. If they miss it, it's on them. But I'm not going to miss it. I'm going to be obedient to God. Now, I want to us now to resist. We're so good at it. I want to lead an all-out right rebellion in wherever I am, some part of Cincinnati, Ohio. Look over at somebody and say, I'm going to get with him. I want to lead an outright rebellion against sickness, against diseases, against spirits of affliction and torment. 
I want to lead an outright resistance because the book said, if I resist the devil, he will flee. I'm tired of trying to medicate the devil. I'm tired of doctors taking the knives and performing surgeries to try to get rid of the devil. I'm tired of going to psychiatrists and giving them my hard-earned money, overcharging my insurance company to help me get back to a sane place in my mind. I'm going to have a holy rebellion against the spirits of hell that are working against my body, against my family, against my finances, against my peace of mind. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and Satan is trespassing on blood bought property. I have a right to be healed. I have a right to be free. I have a right, amen, to have the peace of God rule in my heart and in my mind. Now watch this. Listen to me. We've got laws in the country, and we've got lawbreakers. Satan is a lawbreaker. There's some spiritual laws that have been put in place for the redeemed. And it's illegal for sickness to attack the child of God. Doesn't mean he won't attack, but it means he's breaking the law when he does. Yeah. It's illegal for him to torment you. You don't have to take it, you don't have to give in to something. He's playing with your human emotions. You don't have to feel sad and bad and cry and be hurt and offended. And anybody that tries to encourage you, that tries to reach out to you, get grumpy and grouchy and snap at people and bite their heads off and, and be hateful and you call yourself a child of God, what you need to do is turn the table on the devil. If you're going to be hateful with somebody, be hateful with the devil. If you're going to be short with somebody, be short with the devil. If you're going to bite somebody's head off, bite the devil's head off. Amen. Turn the table and tell him. You say, wait a minute, devil. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Do you see this badge? I've been deputized. When the blood was applied, I was covered in the, I was covered in the badge. God saved me, cover me up in that blood. The reason he didn't take me to heaven is because he's deputized me to walk around on this earth and enforce his laws. Y'all don't hear me? And make arrest against any lawbreaker. And devil, I have come tonight and I have been authorized. I have been delegated authority to bind you, to apprehend you, to arrest you, to confine you, and let you know that you're through tormenting the bridge of hope. You're through tormenting the metro church. You're through Tormenty, Cincinnati, Ohio. Amen. We are the enforcers. We have been anointed and delegated the authority to enforce the laws of Jesus Christ. Now, most of what I most of what I gave y'all tonight is Old Testament. So before I finish here. I'm going to give you some New Testament just for the sake of anybody sitting around out there critiquing everything. I'm going to serve notice on all you that are critiquing. I've already prayed for you. And I've asked God to call you into the ministry. As human as you are, as critical as you are, 
you deserve to be in the ministry. I get up in front of people. All I am is a human being. I've got a personality, and it don't always please people. Not even my wife is happy all the time. But God knew about it before he called me. He said, I've got to send him up there to Cincinnati with that personality. Y'all pray for me. So I want to give you some New Testament. Lord, I hope I'm able to preach in the morning. Y'all are just taking it out of me tonight. Listen to this. Matthew 8 and verse 3. Jesus talking to a leper. Leper's got questions for him. Listen to Jesus. I will. Be thou clean. You know what the leper said? Will you? You know what Jesus said? I will. Hey, listen, Pastor. Within a three-mile radius around this church, there's somebody living within three miles of here. Could possibly be sitting in a room with us right now. They've got enough money to pay off every debt everybody in this room owes. All it just, just, just a flash. Wouldn't even miss it. Boy, isn't that good news? Look over at somebody like it's them. Just, just give them that. Just give them. Come on, look over at that stingy person sitting there. They got everything they need to set us free from the bondage of debt in our life. They, they can pay it all off right now. <laughs> They're able. They've got the means. It's in their hands. They're able. The problem is they're not willing. But I want to tell you something about our God, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. But he's more than able. He's willing. Oh, my Lord. If you're sitting in this room tonight and you had enough money to pop, wipe the debt out of everybody in this room, and I knew you was in here, and I knew you was willing, I'd ask Who, who's with me? Everybody ought to say, ask, preacher. Please ask. Somebody ask. Come on, if you know anybody, ask. Don't be guilty of not asking. Even the Bible says you have not because you ask not. I told God I'll never be guilty. Ask. Jesus is not only able. He's willing. He's willing. Matthew 8, 17 says, I bore your sickness. It's Jesus. Matthew 9, 12 said, if you're sick, you need a physician. And I am the Lord, your great physician. Matthew 14, 14, I am moved with compassion toward the sick and I heal them. Matthew 4, 23, I heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now look over somebody's smile and repeat after me. Matthew 9, 29. Don't work with me now. There it is. According to your faith, be it unto you. Throw up both hands right now and say, I got mine. Matthew 10 11, Luke 9 and 1, I give you power and authority over all unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 12, 15, I heal them all. I wish somebody said, I got mine. 
As many as touch me are made perfectly whole, Matthew 14, 36. Healing is the children's bread, Matthew 15, 26. I do all things well. I make the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak, Matthew 7, 37. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth, Mark 9, 23, Mark 11, 23. When hands are laid on you, you shall recover, Matthew, Mark 16, 18, my anointing. Heals the brokenhearted and delivers the captives, recovers sight to the blind, and sets at liberty those that are bruised. Luke 4 18. I heal all those who have need of healing. Luke 9 and 11. I am not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Luke 9 56. Behold, I give you authority over all the enemy's power, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10 19. Sickness is satanic bondage, and you ought to be loose today. Luke 13, 16, in me is life, John 1 and 4. I am the bread of life, and I give you life, John 6, 33. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life, John 6, 63. I come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, John 14. 14, 14, faith in my name makes you strong and gives you perfect soundness. Acts 3 and 16, I stretch forth my hand to heal. Acts 4 30, I, Jesus Christ, make you whole. Acts 9, 34, I do good and I heal all that are oppressed of the devil. Acts 10, 38, my power causes diseases to depart from you. Acts 19, 12, the law of the spirit of life in me has made you free from the the law of sin and death, Romans 8 and 2. The same spirit that raised me from the dead now lives in you, and that spirit will quicken your mortal body, Romans 8 and 11. Your body is a member of me, says Jesus, 1 Corinthians 6, 15. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are to glorify me in your body, Verse 16, 19. Can somebody say, oh, he's in the New Testament now. I needed to slow down right here because I want you to grab a hold of this. Because he's speaking to born again people right here. If you'll rightly discern my body. We are the body of Christ. We've got to stop being strangers to each other. Stop coming in and finding your little spot and sitting down and not interacting with the other people in the body. All over the country, strangers go to church with each other. People on this side don't know people on that side. People right here don't know people over there. We form opinions and feelings about people by what we see out of them. But God wants us to love one another. And the blood-bought family should be closer to one another than the blood-related family. My, my grandmother, she had kids. All her kids didn't live right. And it was all right for her to talk about what she didn't like about what her kids was doing. But it wasn't all right for somebody else. Are you hearing me? You better not be standing around talking about one of her kids. My Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, sanctified, holy grandmother would lay hands on you. <laughs> and she'd start speaking in some languages that would be easy for you to understand what she meant. Huh? But we'll bite and devour one another in the body. What's this? Look over somebody and say, your healing 
your miracle could very well depend on how you're treating your church family. If you'll rightly discern my body which was broken for you and judge yourself, you will not be judged and you will not be weak and you will not be sickly and you will not die prematurely. Some good preaching coming from back there. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 31. Some of you might want to go back and read that sometime. The way the relationships you have with the church family could determine whether you walk in health or whether you walk in sickness. Whether you live long or whether you die prematurely. You see Paul talking about it. They're, t- they're trying to take communion. And he's talking about the body and the blood of Christ. And how you treat it, how you reference it, how you respect it. And how you partake of it unworthily. He said, now that's the reason why some of you are weak. And so tonight, when church is over, get on the phone, a private message, send text, and apologize to everybody. Isn't that good? And be healed. It might possibly be that the moment that you say, I'm sorry. The symptoms just disappear from your body. <clears throat> if I could get some music, I'd pretend I'm going to quit. <laughs> but it'd be easy because sometimes when I get music, it stirs me up and I go more, man. Just, just be easy, be easy, man. These people, they want me to quit already. (laughs) My church don't let me go this long. (laughs) What was I preaching about? If you can't tell me, I get to start all over. Man, this church is begging for it. Forgive. Y'all want me to quit now, I can tell. (laughs) I go from place to place. I preach, have altar services, lay hands on people. Sometimes God will give me a word for somebody. I speak that to them. Try to be an encouragement. I try to help pastors, encourage pastors. Some people don't realize this, Pastor, but A lot of times the work of an evangelist is not just coming in and encouraging the church or winning a lost person. Sometimes that evangelist, that guest speaker, is for your pastor because they're walking through the fire. The enemy's trying to discourage them, defeat them, get them to quit and give up. And the Lord sends you. To give them a word of encouragement so they keep on going. They don't give up. They don't quit. Isn't it amazing? These pastors know when you invite a guest in and the Holy Spirit uses them. And they don't know your people and the Holy Spirit does. And he speaks to you. I feel like the Lord has spoke to some people in this room tonight. I don't know you. And your pastor's not talked to me, told me anything about you. He ain't even told me anything about his kids. I mean, as nice as they are, he 
He hasn't. He hasn't complained about his wife to me. You're his daughter-in-law. He hasn't said one negative word about you. <laughs> so tonight, if the Lord has spoke to you, it's him. He's touched something in you tonight through the preaching of his word. It's him. He stirred up a question in you. You got mad. It's him. I didn't know. <laughs> I don't, I still don't know. I tell you something, me, me and God, we're going to have some conversations when I get to heaven about everything he didn't tell me before he put me up in front of him and moved on me to say all that I said. You know, I'd like to be a big super duper whooper whopper. I like to be like T.L. Lowry. Some of y'all don't know him. I, I'm telling my age now. He's way on back. I like to be powerful. I like to call people out and put my hands on them and the blind eyes open and the deaf ears pop open. Oh, I do. I, I just, I'd like to be that kind of guy. I've seen it happen. I've seen God do it in my own life. Most of the time on the mission field. But I tell you what I've seen more. I've seen people come up in the altars and need God. And I'd walk over to them and say something like, Would you just forgive? And the moment they said those words, Father, I forgive. Everything broke through. Healing burst in. Deliverance came. Maybe you need to forgive an ex-husband, an ex-wife. Maybe you need to forgive a dad or a stepdad, a mom or a stepmom. Maybe you need to forgive a sister. She's mean as a devil, though. Forgive her anyway. The forgiveness most likely is not going to make her any better because the forgiveness is not meant to heal her. It's meant to heal you. We've got to stop treating forgiveness like it's something negative. There's two things in the body of Christ that disturbs me right now. It's repentance and forgiveness. I mean, you can offend church people by preaching repentance. How dare him tell me I need to repent? How dare him tell me I need to forgive? If I was a devil, I'd feed that lie to you too. I'm saying turn the tables on the devil tonight. Man, I was in a revival one time. I thought I was Benny Hinn. Everybody, I mean, I come close to people, they just fall in the floor. I say, wow, well, man, it's on me now. <laughs> oh, I mean, I seen them going down, buddy. I started going after them. I, I was laying hands on them. I was moving all over that place. But, I mean, it's going down. I said, praise God, look at these people. They falling everywhere. That didn't help me everywhere I went. So I was laying hands on people, and I got over here to this woman, and I put my hand on her. And, man, when I put my hand on her, it's just like ice water just went all over me. And, I mean, it just died. Everything just stopped. I didn't know what was going on. I thought, how in the world did I backslide from moving from one side of the altar over here to this? You know, God was letting me know it never was me to begin with. You know, God's good about keeping you humble. And so I just stopped that altar service, Pastor. 
and I said, look, we're going to start all over. So everybody get up out of the floor. Everybody get up. I said, this don't have anything to do with you. This is all me. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to grow. And something's taking place in the spirit, and I can't understand what it is. And I want to start over. And I want to try again. Man, here I went. They started dropping like flies. I mean, they're just, until I got to that woman, I put my hand on her. Whew, ice water just. I said, Lord, what is that? I said, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. We got to try again. Everybody get back up. <laughs> I'm amazed at how patient people can be with me sometimes. I must really look something. <laughs> and so I made my way. Everything's going great till I touched that woman. And I didn't really get to touch her that time. I just got close to her, and the Holy Spirit spoke a word to me. He said, you tell her it's time to forgive now. And I never touched her. I just said, I said, open your eyes and look at me. The Lord says, that it's okay for you to give now, for, to forgive now. And it broke for her. And she was divinely healed standing right there in that service. I'm going to tell you, I don't know what you've been through. I don't know how bad it hurts you. I don't know the scars you bear because of how you've been treated. I don't know the words your ears have heard that wounded you so deeply. I don't know the things your eyes have seen that have caused you to be the way you are. But the Lord sent me by to tell you He wants to make a whole person out of you. He wants to heal you so that your eyes are no longer tormented by the memories of what they've seen. He wants to heal your ears of the words they've heard that has scarred you your whole life. He wants to heal you for every time someone's took advantage of you and mistreated you. He don't want you to live another day of your life under the shame or the guilt or the bitterness or the anger or the anxiety and fear that it could happen again. Or the deep, dark depression that hovers over you causes you to isolate yourself and withdraw and be afraid to trust again. He not only heals physical afflictions, He heals those emotional wounds, those mental wounds, those psychological wounds. Here's what I want to ask the pastor to help me with on oh, Saturday night. We started an hour early. If y'all let me preach it all out here tonight, I'll preach short in the morning. One of the things the Word of God teaches us about healing and deliverance and miracles is that when you allow someone to lay their hands on you, You go into recovery. How many of you would like to move from the operating room into the recovery room? Sometimes when they lay hands on people in the Bible, evil spirits go out. Man, wouldn't it be wonderful to go home and never be tormented with a spirit of anger again? Just, wow, I don't know what happened. On Saturday night, a spirit of peace come over me. I hadn't cussed again since, praise God. <laughs> be wonderful if God could save our cussing Christians, wouldn't it? <laughs> I want to lay hands on you. I want to obey the word of God. I've got enough faith to be obedient to the word tonight. And I'd just like to ask anybody that's got enough faith to believe that when Pastor and I obey God, 
you're going to obey God too. Our part is to anoint you with oil and place our hands on you. Your part is to believe that the moment we touch you, you're going into recovery. Amen? All right. Anybody. Oh, oh.